Okay, can everybody hear me good? Everybody's good. Ah, oh, great. Well, it's wonderful to be with all of you. What's really great about this is looking around and seeing that we have uh, probably the biggest group in our entrepreneurship uh, lecture series that we've ever had. So um, it really is uh, a great to see entrepreneurship continuing to grow here at Brigham Young. What I also love is to see the number of young women that are here because it's very important that you recognize uh, the, the benefit and blessing that entrepreneurship can be for you. Um, it's one of the greatest ways that you can help support, support a family. Um, if you decide that uh, uh, if, if, if life takes a turn and you don't get married for a while or if you ever have the need to support your family or help support your family, entrepreneurship, there's so many different ways that you can use it and that's the purpose of our class. Now in this first class lecture, um, I helped Steve a little bit still with the, uh, the lecture series, so as long as I'm in town, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be involved uh, during the semester with, the, with this particular class and with Q&A, uh, although this is driven by Steve, um, our, our uh, managing director. But I wanted to talk to you today about some of my own experiences, uh, but I also want to leave just my own experiences and talk about what's going to happen this particular, um, I don't think I got the clicker what's going to happen this year. Let's see. Side? This one. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted you to think about is what you could expect to get out of this class over the next uh, um, uh, many weeks that we get to spend together. So as we were listening to some of the announcement earlier, one of the things that, uh, uh, that they announced, uh, Tyler announced the uh, International Business Model Competition or BYU's Business Model Competition. So I have learned one important truth about entrepreneurship and life in general, and that is that successful people are successful because they are willing to do the things that unsuccessful people are not willing to do. So I know you guys are busy. I know you guys are Mach 5 with your hair on fire. I know that you have more to do than you can say grace over. But as I always told my uh, children growing up, I would shrug my soldier, shoulders and say, guess that's just what it takes, isn't it? And so I never, uh, occasionally I would have to whip out a, a handkerchief and start to dry my eyes, you know, if they got really, you know, emotional about how tough life was getting for them. So. Um, I just want you to know that uh, success comes at a price, but it doesn't come at the price of your family or the gospel of Jesus Christ or anything else. It comes with a price of discipline, of determination, of courage. So we're going to talk about some of those things, but you're going to learn a little bit more in this class about who you are and what you have the power to become, because almost anybody that takes this class after they've heard 13 lectures, will sit back and say, there's more to me than I thought. Also, you'll learn how to network, and you're going to learn the value of networking. And a lot of the success that I've had in business has been because I learned how to network. And uh, people got aware of what we were doing, and then that's how uh, sales take place. That's how you find good people to work for you. Uh, so much good happens by networking. The correct process for starting a business Years ago, it could be easily said that 90% of all businesses failed. I think today that when people follow the process, the right way to start a business, that actually, uh, according to one of these movies that uh, you, some of you guys like to go to, the odds are in your favor. But you have to know the correct process of starting a business. We're going to talk about that. Also, you will learn from about 13 different people, what uh, we learn in the church as the Lord's Law of Witnesses, right? You're going to learn from about 12 or 13 people factors of success, critical factors of success, and you're going to hear them repeat it over and over and over, and pretty soon you're going to get to the point where you say, I think I get that, that's pretty important. And to those people who have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to understand, there's a lot of things that you're going to be able to get to. And then how to cull or mine tidbits of experience out of people that maybe you don't even think are the most exciting lectures that you've ever heard in your life. It's beside the point. What do they have to say? And, and, and it's going to be up to you to dig out what there is to get because 
I can promise you that Steve and Seth are not going to invite somebody here that isn't, doesn't deserve to be here and that you can't learn a lot of things from. And then, obviously, the more you put, out, put, put into this class, the more you're going to get out of it. Don't think of this class as one of those just easy A's, although, shh, it is, okay? Um, I'm just telling you, the more that you put into it, the more that you'll get out of it. So I'm trying to rush through part of this. Oh, by the way, this is my biggest entrepreneurial endeavor. It's the best one I've ever done or will ever do. And there's absolutely nothing more important to me than the five people who are my children and their spouses. They're all married now, and this has grown quite a bit uh, because I have, I think, five more grandchildren that are shown in this picture. But uh, I think that this will be the most important thing to you, too. And if I could say something right up front, make me a promise today. Make me a promise. Make yourself a promise that no matter how successful that you become, that nothing will transplay or re replace your faith. There's nothing more important. Not one thing. So this is how I got started. Because a lot of times, you know, you start, you, you start thinking about, well, this guy is an old guy. Not really. I always tell my, uh, even my married kids, if they're still ready to bring it, bring it. <laughs> so um, at the end of the day, they do still call me older. And I suppose the years, you know, dictate that I am a little bit older. But, but I had to get started just like you did. And so a lot of times people want to know how that happened. So I started in sales. I recognized it as a skill of mine. I recognized it as an interest of mine. I recognized that I had uh, an ability to be able to rate, relate with people, an ability to be able to be, um, uh, to give good presentations, to be persuasive, and you know, by developing powerful relationships of trust, doing what you say you're gonna do, I learned just all the things that I learned on my mission. So that's how I got started. Sales management, became the national sales manager. I went into general management, and then I started my own business. But this is, how it, uh, this is how it all got started. So I've got uh, you know, two different companies that I worked for during this period of time. Um, I became the top salesperson in my organization. <laughs> I had the least education because my father was a high school English teacher. And my mother didn't work. And we had seven in my family. And so from the time that I was 11 until I went on my mission, I worked. And I worked to be able to not just provide for my fun, but to provide for some of the necessities as well, including clothing and including my car and gas and every other thing that, uh, that was needed is just how it was and the majority of my mission expenses. So when I came home, I came home to an empty bank account. Um, so I had a lot of motivation. Um, when I went to, when I started selling, again, I was the youngest person in the uh, company out of 225. Uh, but I found that by working harder, they I found out that they couldn't outwork me. I found out that they didn't love people more than I did. I found out that I could be as honest or more honest than anybody out there. And all of these things developed credibility and trust. And so I became very quick, very rapidly uh, the top salesperson in our organization. Then they made me a sales manager. And it took me a little while to figure out. But then I became a successful sales manager and then a division manager. All along the way, I'm gaining experience and I'm gaining confidence because I'm saying to myself, gee, if I can build three sales territories for my, uh, somebody else, certainly, why would I doubt the fact that I can do it for myself? So, those, you know, so entrepreneurship isn't all about just taking stupid risks. It's about knowing what you're capable of and, uh, and, then, and then artfully uh, and methodically going out for the skills that you're going to need to have to be able to succeed. So I started my first business in 1988, and I mortgaged my house. Sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, you've got three kids, and you've got two car payments. And you know, over a period of about six years, I had amassed about um, 50000 or so in uh, equity in my house. And um, so I accessed that. My partner accessed his. And that's how we got started with the business. And so a lot of people think that's risky. But I go back to what I just told you, that I already had built three territories. I was pretty sure I wasn't going to have trouble building another sales territory on my own. So, uh, But it does take a lot of uh, um, the ability to deal with vagary. 
You know that I never once felt stress in my whole life that I can remember until I actually sold my first business and had a lot of money to, to actually shepherd and be a steward over. So all the other pressures of the, the first business, it didn't feel like it. But for some reason that changed after I sold my first business. But you have to have a stomach for a little bit of uncertainty. It wasn't the most sexy product uh, that you could imagine on the planet. We sold medical and safety products to business and industry. Basically, we took these uh, first aid cabinets as well as the little ones that you put in construction vehicles and, and so forth, and, and you can find these in every um, uh, business in America and a service that replenishes all the things that uh, are used. So it's like the razor and the razor blade type idea. Um, anyway, we bootstrapped it through internal profits and uh, developed a proprietary distribution model and management system, and we ended up uh, selling it to Centos in 1997. Centos is uh, probably about a $6 billion company today, and it's an it's a exceedingly well-run company. I, I still have friendships over there, and I highly, highly regard the time that I spent there. Um, at any rate, um, then I actually did something I wasn't planning to do, which, you know, selling a business allows you to do it. I wrote a book. Um, I wrote a book on the apostasy. So um, it was a book on early Christianity. Um, I wasn't uh, a scholar in this thing, but I read more books, and my library's bigger than most of the scholars that I know, including the ones here on campus. And, uh, and I've read uh, almost all the books uh, that are in that uh, uh, library as well, so that this is a very well-researched book. And then, uh, um, and I, I mentioned this because life unfolds, and you never know exactly what you're meant to do but I promise you that if, you that if you put the gospel of Jesus Christ front and center in your life, then you will actually be able to figure out what matters most and you'll be able to do the things that keep you grounded and settled uh, in spite of whatever success that you have. Clearly, as I have, you know, have many friends that are in the entrepreneurial community, I find that some of them struggle with being able to deal with wealth. And it shouldn't be any of you. Your faith should be grounded and settled, and it comes first. And I can tell you, after spending this much time in the scriptures and in early Christianity, and I spent three years full-time, 14-hour days, six days a week, I worked harder in this endeavor than I did in any single one of my businesses. And when I was done, it was a product that I was uh, proud of, and I had learned more. And if I didn't sell a single book, I had enriched my life in a way that uh, uh, was going to uh, serve me throughout the eternities to come. So I wrote a second one here that came out about a year ago called Do the Mormons Have a Leg to Stand On? A critical look at LDS doctrines in the light of the Bible and the teachings of the early Christian church. And it basically compares first century doctrines uh, with uh, the church's doctrines. Um, all right, moving forward here, I decided to start another company called APU Solutions. So APU Solutions, uh, there, there was a lot of things that I learned about this particular, from this company. It was my first software company, and I learned that I really didn't understand software very well. And uh, so I made a lot of mistakes, and uh, it's, it's good to know, though, that uh, um, I was talking to a friend uh, that we all know here at the center very well uh, on Friday night, and um, I scrapped my uh, first product. It cost me about a million dollars to scrap it and start over again, which wasn't very fun to think about since most of it was all my money. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, my friend, as we were talking, and he's a seasoned, more seasoned than I was when I started that company, and he's re redone his whole platform five times. So there's a lot to learn about doing it right, and we're going to show you how to do that. Um, so the lean process, which you're going to hear a lot about, and I'm going to spend some time a little bit later, and incremental learning and timely pivots. And leadership is the principle that you can learn, and you can learn it now. You can learn it at this age, and you can become phenomenal leaders. I have a 26-year-old young man, graduate of BYU, that's uh, employee number one at Omadi, and I think that he's as wise as most 40- or 45-year-old people. I spent a lot of time mentoring this kid, and he's amazing. I'd put, stack him up uh, against uh, anybody. And then this whole idea, you know, that businesses succeed not because you're the greatest thing that ever, you know, walked the planet or that you have so much skill more than anybody else. It happens because you don't quit. 
because you put one foot in front of the other, you keep learning from your mistakes, you don't repeat the mistakes that you made the first time, and eventually, because you don't quit, you don't fail. You only failed after you quit. So you gotta put yourself in a situation not to quit. But anyway, we, this took 12 years. I could tell you stories about this that would sort of make you say, I don't wanna do entrepreneurship, which is basically how I feel about every single company that I have started. Every single company that I've started, if I knew what was gonna take, or if I knew what was gonna happen, I'd say, nope, I'm not doing that one. But then I'm always happy at the end that I did it. So, because I haven't had one falter yet. Okay, so we sold this company and we did very well on this. And then Best Final was actually a company I started in the middle and uh, with a friend of mine. Actually, it was a friend of mine that started the business. It was very young, a year into it, and I purchased 50% of the business. It was tiny, struggling. And um, anyway, we built a very successful business. It became um, 35 million and, and uh, then we sold it to a private equity group. And then um, I went to run one of my portfolio companies, uh, an insurance business called, that had a unique business model of insourcing our employees into the HR departments of large corporations, more than 4,000 employees. And uh, we would communicate their benefits free of charge for our clients. And for this, they gave us access to all their employees. And it's a little bit deeper than that, but uh, it's an incredibly successful company. It has grown immensely. Um, since I left it, we laid the foundation for scaling and it's, it's uh, done incredible. Uh, another company that I helped save uh, that was, uh, that was uh, in bankruptcy and we pulled this out of the ashes and uh, it's a great technology. You can look it up online for a little more. Uh, a little more. And then um, in 2010, the dean of the business school, uh, I was... Uh, um, like many of the entrepreneurs uh, around this area, I had been a founder uh, or a don donated uh, money to the school here since about 1998. And um, so at any rate, uh, the dean of the uh, business school at the time, Gary Corney, asked me if I'd consider running the entrepreneurship program. And uh, so we actually did that for five and a half years. And uh, prior to that, I had been the chairman of the founder organization and had gotten heavily involved, was pretty much working I don't know, three quarters time for about a year prior to joining the center full time. So six years running when the company was, uh, when, the, when the organization, when the Center for Entrepreneurship was unranked, for six years running now it's been one of the top programs in the entire country. Uh, we ranked number two this last year. So, you know, you pretty much are going to the best school in the country when it comes to entrepreneurship if you will take advantage of the resources that Steve talked about up in 470. Now, one of the things that you'll learn, and I've been able to share this along, we started with a vision. In 2010, there was no vision, but we developed a vision. You know what the vision was? It was go big or go home. It was, we will be the, uh, the global leader in successful campus-inspired entrepreneurial ventures. That was it. We will be the, the uh, global leader in successful campus-inspired entrepreneurial ventures. And you know what? I think almost by any measure that you could look at, we've been able to achieve that because we first set it up as a vision. And that's something that, uh, that you're going to have to think about. Businesses require a vision. OK, Elmati is my current venture. We are a SaaS software uh, platform, uh, mobile management platform for workforce management. So basically, right now, we're in the transportation industries, the towing industry, the security industry, and the recovery industry. And, uh, and, and also in the insurance industry as it late relates to uh, towing and other uh, different things. It's taken off like a, a little rocket ship and uh, we're excited about the growth and about the uh, things that we're uh, doing currently. So I wanted to start out with this and we've got about 20 minutes for me to sort of knock this out of the ballpark. So that's my intention. So 3,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, Solomon said these words, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That came as divine revelation. As you know, he prayed for wisdom, or, and that, he was asked whatever gift, and he prayed for wisdom, and he was given wisdom. But there was no what we would term scientific knowledge about you know, 
what that really meant. Would you agree, 3,000 years ago? Okay. About 80 years ago, this author, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, he said, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. 80 years ago, once again, no science behind it, but it echoed the words of Solomon, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The reason I'm saying this is because you need to be careful about what you think about. Because you will find out very quickly that your life does in fact, as you've been told, especially return missionaries, that your life is the sum total of your thoughts. Guarantee you it's true. So let's talk about now some scientific research that backs it. In 2002, when I was researching my first book, because I wanted to be able to understand some things relating to scripture, then I came upon this. Uh, even the adult brain is plastic, able to forge new connections among its neurons and thus rewire itself. Sensory perception or sensory input, input can change the brain and the brain remodels itself in response to behavioral demands. I want you to think about that. Your brain remodels itself in response to behavioral demands. The existence and importance of brain plasticity are no longer in doubt. The brain is dynamic and the life we lead leaves its mark in the complex circuitry of the brain, footprints of the experiences that we've had, the thoughts we've thought, and the actions that we have taken. The brain allocates, and this is an important point, neural real estate depending on what we use most. The thumb of the video game addict, the index finger of a braille reader, the analytic ability of a chess player, the language skills of a linguist, but the brain rewires itself on something much more ephemeral than what we do. It rewires itself based on what we think. And I'm talking hardwired. That's what it does. So, Jeffrey M. Schwartz is the researcher that published this book in 2002. So if you just think about it, I have a good friend that uh, I served in the state presidency many years ago in Kansas City area. And he was visiting with me about, oh, eight or 10 years ago. And he said, you know, Scott, I was visiting with, because he is a cons uh, he's on a mission now, but he was uh, consulting for um, the Fortune 500 companies all over the world, the big global corporations. And um, he was visiting with a very, very successful psychologist. And the psychologist said to him, you know, Craig, if we had to make a living based on really changing people's behaviors, we'd all be bankrupt. That's how hard it is to change. Now, you take somebody like myself or Steve uh, or others in this room who consider themselves to be highly motivated people, but every one of us have blind spots. Every one of us have things about us that are imperfect. How hard is it for you to change those things? I'm telling you, it's enough to make a grown man cry. That's how hard it is, okay? And so you should admit that, but yet change is possible. It's possible based on what we think. It's possible based on the atonement. And I want you to think about the whole idea then of what we think as it relates to negative things such as pornography or positive things such as changing your life. So, um, one of the things that I sort of want to introduce you to is the uh, cultural changes that you might be uh, uh, hearing about as you go forward into the workplace. So take a look and we see that uh, those guys that are older than me, I'm not that old, okay? These are the traditionalists. Um, and they're the old school people, truly the old school people. Then you get the baby boomers, that's my era. And you know we grew up in an era uh, of probably more things than the generation before because the generation before all grew up during the depression and they were used to nothing. 
They were used to no help from the government. They weren't used to getting student loans. They weren't used to any of those things that help you today. They didn't have them. There's good and there's bad that goes along with that. The good is that you get things that they couldn't get. The bad is if you're not careful, you'll not only feel entitled, but you'll act entitled. Because you won't recognize how important it is for you to have to do stinking hard things. Things that do make grown people cry. And you come out the other side and know that you're capable of doing them. And then there's the Gen Xers, the people that are 30 to 45 and the people that are up to 30. And, uh, and so there's a lot being written about you guys today. And some of it, it's true. I just had a high school student in my neighborhood that asked me to write him a letter of recommendation. And in preparing for it, he sent me a couple of things that he had written and he wrote on this subject. And he concluded, after all of the research with his peers, it was true. But that's the good news, is we can recognize that, hey, we grew up and it was a little easier. My kids, I helped them uh, pay for, I paid for the majority of their college, but I made them invest in their own education so they wouldn't get this feeling. And I made them work all through high school. I did things for them that my parents couldn't do for me, but I made them do tons of things so that they would not feel entitled. And I can tell you what, my son that is just graduating this year in the industrial design program here has pulled more, more all-nighters at 26 years old, I think, than I've done in my whole life. The guy is a freaking workhorse. So um, at any rate, job well done. Thank, um, yeah. <laughs> OK, so this guy, six years ago, when I came to the center, I'd never heard of this guy, and nobody in any university had heard of this guy other than a few researchers. This is the guy that, well, in case you couldn't remember who he is, anybody heard of uh, MIT? Okay, that's Sloan School of Management, that's Alfred Sloan, that is the father of the modern corporation, General Motors, okay, that's him. But he's not the founder of the business. He's not the entrepreneur. That's this guy, Billy Durant. So Billy Durant started General Motors, or Chevrolet, I can never remember which now. But at any rate, he uh, came from the horse and buggy area where he did the, uh, uh, the buggies and made different makes and models and you know all different sorts of cool things, and he got rich. So along comes the automobile, and he decides that he's going to take his same processes and roll them over into building new cars. And that's how come we have uh, uh, General Motors. And the only, only problem is, is he wasn't a seasoned operator. He was a gunslinger. He was an entrepreneur. So the difference between entrepreneurship over here in the left hand, I put out my left hand because for a reason. And over here in the right hand is your business people. Business is executing on a known business model. Burger King, McDonald's, a known business model. Entrepreneurship over here is, ex or is uh, finding the answers, discovering the answers to unknown, untested, untried, unproven business models. And at some point, the entrepreneurship part actually goes away and it turns into a business which is now proven. Entrepreneurship, business. Two different things. They're not even on the same planet, let alone hemisphere. Okay? And the reason that business schools failed at teaching entrepreneurship for so many years is because they treated entrepreneurship like, biz business, like big business's little brother. And it couldn't be further from the truth. And they did fail, and they failed miserably at teaching it. And they even thought that it couldn't be taught for so many years. And I'm here to tell you, I'm a witness, that you can teach entrepreneurship, and you can be successful in running your own business. Know who this guy is? 
Philo Farnsworth. You know where he went to school? Brigham Young. You know what he discovered? The television. But because he wasn't yet a finished entrepreneur, whoops, um, entrepreneur, he never actually reaped all the benefits. It was Motorola, I can't remember now, but anyway. Um, so we're going to talk about, um, during the course of this semester, this paradigm shift and how you really start a business. Now, there's a, a couple different ways to think about running a business, and I like to liken it to playing basketball. So for those of you that play basketball, you'll kind of get easily what I'm saying here. But to be a good basketball player, you've got to be able to dribble. You've got to be able to shoot. You've got to be able to shoot free throws. You've got to be able to rebound. You've got to be able to pass. You've got to be able to play defense. And you've got to be in good physical con condition and blah, blah, right? You can take each one of those in isolation and you can practice them, AKA when my oldest son was, um, uh, in kindergarten, I hired a college basketball player to teach him how to dribble, and he put him through dribbling drills and blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. But at any rate, um, so instead of, uh, instead of it being the things that we're talking about with basketball, it's administration. You know, it's the reception desk, the first touch, all those different things that go into that. It is operation, shipping, receiving, inventory, product assembly, whatever you've got there, sales and sales management and marketing and branding and finance and legal and technology and production, manufacturing, research and development. You know what? I learned in my business best final that you can actually take this and make it work. I could tell you long stories about how in five years, Against all odds, we became the largest vinyl fence company in the country, three times bigger than any of our competitors. I had really good partners that were outstanding <laughs> at the end of the day. But we were able to perfect all of those sorts of things. And when people, for example, saw a sales presentation from Best Vinyl versus a competitor, it was like saying, okay, here is a 10 presentation and here is a five. And if you're a homeowner and you see a 10 over here and then you see a 5 from everybody else, you know, it doesn't take you long to figure out you're going to get ahead of the pack. Even though we had uh, probably less money than the other guys to, to operate on, uh, they had been at it for since 1985 and 1992 respectively and we didn't start until 2003 or 2002, sorry. <clears throat> All right, moving quickly. This year, this is how the Rollins Center is set up. It's really important that you understand this if you have a big interest in entrepreneurship. If you look at the <coughs> first part of the year, the September through uh, October 15 or so, everything we practically did was designed to teach people the process of how do you come up with a great idea. And once you have a great idea, how do you develop that idea and move it along to the next step? And the next step is business model development and customer validation. And so you heard Tyler at the beginning of the class today talk about that in early February, we're going to have the BYU business model competition. And if you want to get a big head start, you go to Steve up in 470. And believe me, there's a lot of resources that we have that will help you. Um, and then the, the next part of it is launching, and that's where the Miller New Venture Challenge comes in uh, in uh, late March, early April. And, and uh, you, you have no idea how many businesses have come out of Brigham Young University were killing it. I mean, the number of businesses that are just doing uh, outstanding, it's like, uh, the, it's just to put a number on it, I mean, yes, you can put a number on it, it's not like it's in the thousands, but, uh, we have you know, hundreds of companies that are being successful as a result of the training they got right here in the Rollins Center. So, and then finally scaling, and this is where we have a, a summer founders launch pad. So the teams who win the Miller New Venture Challenge get the opportunity to be able to um, uh, get a $15,000 paycheck 
and it pays for them to be able to go through the summer and not have to work so they can focus all their attention on building their business. And this is one of the reasons why we've been so successful. So you're going to see this and you'll have access to the slides. This is an important slide to remember. When you're starting a business, this is how I have found that it usually unfolds. So you go from an idea uh, to a real customer. And this is where it's project based. There's not the process system, repeatable best practices. That's not there yet. You're trying to find out whether or not you even have something you know, that is going to sell in the open marketplace. And so you need to do these one step at a time so that you don't put the cart before the horse. The second one is uh, operational validation where we go from a real customer to a functioning enterprise. So you start to sell a bunch of customers, then pretty soon you realize, oh, I gotta have someone to implement these customers, I gotta have somebody to count the money, I gotta have more people to make the business go, and you just sort of you know, begin to scale up. Then you have financial validation. This is where you actually put in place uh, during the latter part of, uh, of this phase, and in this phase you're putting in place all of these processes and systems and repeatable best practices, and you can't put them in too early or you cripple the business and its growth. You can't put them in too late or you stumble over yourself and fall as you start to scale. And so it's really important to be able to follow that process. And then sustainability is continuous innovation improvement, and that's how that works. So here's a few things that I want you to remember. Um, you're going to read the book, nail it, then scale it, okay? Uh, don't take too long to read it. It, you know, it's really about a four-hour read. Uh, read it early and often and, and have your yellow highlighter by it. Uh, and then just make that a dog-eared book uh, that you really know and understand and love. You're going to need to get to know the lean approach, business model development, the business model canvas, customer validation, learning to go outside the building instead of inside the building. And that's really talking about research isn't going to Mrs. Google. That's not research, okay? Research is getting outside the building and actually visiting with customers. And then uh, iteration, pivot, scrum development, agile development, development, a minimum viable product, or, and then even you get to the point where you have a minimum awesome product. So this is what I want you to think about. How are you going to liken the things that you learn in this class to your own personal situation. If, if you are open to revelation, you'll have it concerning this class. You'll have it. And you'll have things happen to you, and you'll know that it's because you likened what you were learning to your own situation. And then you listen to the Spirit, you take good notes, tailor the message, study, ponder, and practice, and develop leadership, because whatever you decide to do in life, period, being a good leader helps it along. So you might as well focus today. As I said at the beginning of the class, successful people are successful because they're willing to do the things that unsuccessful people are not willing to do. And this is one of my favorites, that many people have a gold fever, but dang few have the digging spirit. It's BYU, I could use a different uh, you know, word to describe that, but I'm telling you, it's so important that you learn that hard work is it. And then most students don't attend the Q&A because they think that they have other stuff and then I refer them back to successful people are successful because they're willing to do the things that unsuccessful people are not willing to do. And you know, I have students that never miss because they recognize that. And then your career will evolve and so you need to place yourself into a position where number one, you pay attention to the gifts and talents that God gave you. And number two, you pay attention to your patriarchal blessing. And number three, you actually think about uh, the, um, the experiences that you're having, the opportunities that are in front of you, and it will become clear to you how your life should unfold one line at a time. Anyway, it is going to be a fantastic uh, uh, being with you. Um, I'm not going to go through this. But I can tell you this is true. This is the most important thing.